Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Friday, February 2nd, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, it's an interesting day so far today. The market doesn't seem to want to go anywhere as far as both bonds and equities go. We're seeing a sell-off in both. The market doesn't really want to put its cash uh, in either area. Uh, you can see here the Dow Jones Industrial Average having another rough day, down over 400 points today. The S&P 500 down 35, NASDAQ and Russell 2000, you can see following suit. All of the major indices down close to their lows of the day. 10-year Treasury yield going in the opposite direction. Normally, the 10-year uh, Treasury yield goes in the same direction as equities. That is not the case today. We are seeing a sell-off in bonds, sending yields higher, but we're also seeing a sell-off in equities as well. Uh, cyclicals, if, if there's one area of strength, it's definitely the XLY. We've seen consumer discretionary actually uh, kind of buck the trend. Uh, the big reason for that is you can see that the broadline retailer is having a good day, and that comes on the heels of an incredibly strong report from Amazon last night after the closing bell. Amazon reported great results, and you can see that stock is up $72 right now off of its uh, continuing move to the upside. Uh, on the flip side, though, you can see Apple not performing well after its latest quarterly report. Google also taking it on the chin. And uh, the energy sector also falling. This is the worst performing group today. Down, you can see 3.5% today. Chevron reported earnings this morning. Market didn't like it. We came up short on Chevron and on ExxonMobil. And so just a lot of selling taking place today. And with that, I will bring in my host, uh, our co-host, Aaron. How are you doing this morning, Aaron? I'm doing quite well. I just got a message that I guess today is Groundhog Day. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so happy Groundhog Day. Wow, thank you. <laughs> is that for me or for everyone? Uh, for everyone. Oh, okay. Happy Groundhog Day, happy everybody. Groundhog Day, everybody. Uh, apparently, the Groundhog, uh, I don't know if he found his shadow or not, but uh, maybe he did something, and that's why we're seeing this market just uh, dropping like a rock right now. I think you know, a lot of people are nervous about it. Uh, that's honestly what I like to see. I like to see uh, sentiment get really bearish. People get really nervous because that's when you turn back around. So we'll see. Yeah, I think uh, the 2007 to 2009 bear market is seeing its shadow this morning. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what it's looking like to me. But uh, anyway, we got a ton to go over today. I know you have an interesting segment that you're going to get into in just a bit. Why don't you go through the announcements and the agenda with everybody? Absolutely. So, so far uh, for the week, what we have scheduled, of course, today I'm doing my uh, sifting scans workshop, but next week is going to be pretty exciting. We have Chip Anderson, president of Stock Charts. He's going to come in and talk about uh, everything stock charts. We'll have to see exactly what it is. Gordon Scott uh, from Investopedia, and some of you may recognize his name from the CMT. Uh, he will be here on Wednesday. And then Arthur Hill is going to be here on Thursday. And uh, it's been a while since we've seen Arthur, so it'll be exciting to get to talk to him again. So, so far, that's what we have on our schedule. But today, packed agenda as usual. I'm going to be doing my workshop on sifting scans. That will start shortly, uh, followed by Under the Radar. Tom's going to look at some stocks uh, that he thinks are under the radar currently. 10 and 10 to 1, as usual, 10 minutes to 1. Procter & Gamble will be our first stock symbol. So if you want to go take a look at that. And finally, we'll finish up with a sentiment update. I'll let you know where sentiment is, as I hint about people starting to feel more bearish right now. And with that, Tom? I'm going to just hand it back to you to go over all that technical news. I know there's a lot going on today. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you all are big fans of uh, Chris Berman on ESPN when he had the fastest three minutes in sports. But I think oh, I, remember, I remember that. Yeah, I may come up with the fastest 10 minutes in uh, stock market analysis here because there is a ton. Really, I, I think I could probably go through um, probably for the next couple of hours everything taking place in the market. But. Let's talk about it and try and get through things fairly quickly here. January non-farm payrolls were out this morning. 200,000 jobs. The market was expecting 175,000. Private payrolls also well above expectations, 196,000 versus 172,000. The January unemployment report came in as expected, 4.1%. January average hourly earnings also 
came in as expected. They rose 0.3%. Then a little bit later, January consumer sentiment came out 95.7. The market was expecting 95. So a little bit of good news there in terms of the consumer. And December factory orders a little bit better than expected, up 1.7% versus the market's in uh, ex expectation of 1.5% rise. So all the news this morning came in very positive. And you can see the 10-year Treasury yield reacted about as we would expect. The uh, bond market sold off. Yields continue to rise. The 10-year Treasury yield, uh, this move over the last five weeks now has been very impressive from about the 2.40% level up to 2.84% now. Very big move higher in the 10-year Treasury yield. But let's take a look at some of the areas of the market that uh, are worth talking about. As the market pulls back, one of the things I like to watch is the XLY versus the XLP ratio. This is simply telling me how consumer stocks are performing. The XLY is the more aggressive area of consumer stocks. The XLP is the more defensive area. So anytime this ratio is rising, this isn't telling us that the consumer discretion area is going up or that the consumer staples area is going down. What this is telling us is that discretionary is outperforming, continuing to outperform staples. This normally does not coincide with a market top. Normally market tops, longer term market tops, coincide with this ratio actually beginning to drop as prices move higher. It tells us that defensive stocks are starting to lead and we don't want to see that. So I like the way this particular ratio is looking at this point. Transports versus utilities. I also like to follow this. You can see throughout December and throughout much of January, this ratio was rising. Again, it tells us that the more aggressive area of transportation, uh, which should do well in an expanding economy, uh, was performing very well relative to utilities for about six to eight weeks. We have seen that start to roll over a little bit, but we're going to get pullbacks from time to time. This doesn't really concern me at this point. We're pulling back with the overall market, pulling back a little bit. So I still think this ratio continues to look okay. Within the transports, let's take a look at the airlines. After a beautiful move here to the upside in the first half of January, we did have a negative divergence in play, higher prices, lower PPO reading. And we have since seen a move back down really to that 50-day moving average. And the PPO has reset. It's actually a little bit now below that zero line. I would be real careful. Right now, we've seen some heavy volume selling to take us below that key 20-day moving average. That is now rolled over and is declining. So this uh, the subsequent rise or recent rise in airlines could not get back established above that 20-day moving average. And we're starting to roll over. I've drawn a couple of horizontal lines here to mark a couple of key short-term support levels to watch. If this uh, turns back down here with a PPO that's in negative territory and moving lower, I would not be at all happy with this group. So airlines, I think this is the weakest part of the transports right now. Railroads. You can see with the highs in December and January, higher prices, lower PPO readings, and we have gone back down. And we have what I consider to be a centerline reset or just about a centerline reset on the PPO, along with a 50-day test on the uh, daily chart here. And that's what I look for after a negative divergence. Now, a negative divergence can mark a longer-term top. So once we get these resets, we have to see what happens from here. If we lose the 50-day moving average, I think we have really good support on the railroads at about 1770. That's where we saw a gap down the last time we had weakness. We had a gap down on very heavy volume, printed a hollow candle, meaning that we had buyers coming in at that 1770 level on heavy volume. So I don't want to lose that level. If we lose 1770, it could be a much steeper drop down to price support uh, around the 1680 area. So that is your daily chart on the uh, Railroads, here's your daily chart on the truckers. So this is another area of transportation. This, I think, just looks like a normal pullback uh, with the overall market. Price action moving higher. You can see the PPO also was moving higher. We've pulled back. We've tested that rising 20-day moving average. I think things look pretty good here. The Russell 2000, I mentioned in my blog, I think it was yesterday, I was watching a couple of key support levels on the Russell 2000 uh, in, I'm going to say, the 1550 to 1560 area. That's the two horizontal lines you see coming across. You also, if you connect the lows from back in August and November and uh, just project those out to the current time frame, you can see that that trend line is being tested right now as well. 
So there's a lot of support in this area on the Russell 2000 that I would like to see hold. Here is the Russell 2000 on an hourly basis. So this is going back the last couple of, well, actually the last month. But notice the failures on the hourly chart. If you want to, you know, you want to hold that daily chart, that support we just talked about. But on the hourly, one of the first clues is going to be getting back up above that declining 20-day, excuse me, 20-hour EMA. We have failed the last couple of times testing it with the hourly PPO below the center line. So that's what you expect with a downtrending PPO below the center line is failure at that declining 20-hour EMA. If you want to start getting things to turn around here on the small caps, first thing we have to do is hold support on the daily chart. And then here on the hourly chart, we need to move back up and clear that 20-hour EMA. Easier said than done, as we can see. The Dow Jones, here's a one-hour chart. You can see what I think maybe is establishing as a, a down channel on the, the uh, large cap uh, conglomerates that make up the, uh, the Dow Jones. But we continue to put in lower lows and lower highs. So I'd like to see this channel break uh, before I'd get too much more or before I'd get too aggressive on the, the Dow. S&P 500, very similar. You can see that over the last five days or so, we have been uh, downtrending. This uptrend is clearly broken right now. Volume's been pretty decent on this move to the downside, and you can see the hourly PPO remains quite negative at this point. Here is a daily chart on the S&P. So we just talked about this down channel that we've been watching on the hourly chart, but on the daily chart, you can see this green arrow. Anytime you've got the PPO rising like this and accelerating, what I normally look for is a pullback and, a, and support found at that rising 20-day moving average. If you look back really over the last four or five months, anytime we've had the uh, PPO on the rise and we've pulled back, we've held this rising 20-period moving average, testing it twice. Uh, this we didn't quite test it, but we, we did stop just short of testing it, move back higher and break out again. So yes, we are seeing some of the biggest selling that we have seen in quite some time, and it's definitely unnerving, but this is a normal test in an uptrending uh, chart. Yeah, as you can see, the huge move up. It has been a pretty big move. We got up to 28.75 or thereabouts, and we are now back down almost 100 points on the S&P 500 literally in a week. So it's been a big move down, no doubt. The uh, S&P again here, I'm going to pull up the weekly chart. So now let's take a big picture view. If the, fifth, if the uh, um, support on the daily chart doesn't hold, let's go back to the daily again. If this 20-day moving average does not hold, what should we be looking for? Well, on the weekly chart, you can see that there's potentially another 100 points down to the 20-week moving average, which has held back since the election in late 2016. So with that weekly PPO looking very strong and accelerating to the upside, a pullback and test of the rising 20-week moving average is a possibility. Now, I know I've given you lots of different things to consider here, but the point is, if you lose that rising 20-day moving average on the daily chart, I think it starts to set up more weakness on the S&P 500. So I'd like to see a reversal later today. If not, we could see more selling next week. Hey, Tom, I don't know what it is, but our uh, I don't know if my mic's doing it, but it's sort of fading in and out, like it gets loud and then it gets quiet. So um, I guess just make sure you're talking directly into the mic. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't moved. I got... I've got my uh, lips right up to the don't microphone. You love it. Pre-show, everything is perfectly fine. And then we get on air and, you know. Yep. Yep. I know. But All I'm right. talking Just right into going. it, doing the best I can. Um, the XLE uh, Energy. And we talked recently, well, last few months, we saw financials. We saw uh, industrials. I think we also saw materials go through these negative divergences where we start to run out of steam to the upside. The XLE did it about a week and a half ago. Higher prices, lower PPO. What I look for is a PPO centerline test and a 50-day test, and it seems like energy is headed in that direction. Part of the problem with energy, CVX. CVX reported its earnings this morning, beat on the top line, but came way short on the bottom line, 73 cents versus a buck 27. I haven't seen the details of why they missed by such a wide margin, but that is not a good uh, earnings report. The uh, same thing happened to ExxonMobil, 88 cents versus a buck six, and Exxon 
missed on the top line as well. Pretty big miss, about 10% below expectation. So that is leading to some weakness in the energy space. And you can see CVX now testing a very key uh, on a weekly chart, very key 20 week EMA uh, with uh, the rising PPO. This is an area I'd be looking for support. You also have price support just beneath this rising 20 week moving average. A few more charts here. Let's talk about Apple. Apple reported its results last night. Pretty interesting. I, I saw an article that was talking about their iPhone and the iPad and everything else coming up short of expectations on the sales front, the number of units, yet they beat on their top line by $2 billion. Um, I'm not sure how, and I did see something that, that talked about the fact that their uh, price per unit was better than expected. And I guess that made up the difference because they fell short on the units, but they beat on their top line, they beat on their bottom line, and the market really doesn't care much. You got a negative divergence. That's been in place for quite some time here on the weekly chart on Apple. Higher prices, lower PPO. I think we're heading back probably to test this 50-week moving average, especially if we can't hold on to price support in that 160 area. We'll see whether or not that holds. Amazon, what more can you say? Great report. They blew out their numbers. Uh, they beat on the top line. Their bottom line, $2.16 versus buck eighty-five. I think I saw their profits were $2 billion. Just unbelievable. Um, beautiful move up, great volume, but overbought. That's how the market was a week ago. We're seeing selling in a lot of the areas of the market, not in Amazon. Google, Google uh, had a nice report, uh, at least on the top line. They did beat on revenues. They came short, came up short on their earnings per share, though, 970 versus 1012. And you can see we are getting a pretty significant reversing candle on Google that I think sets up a possible test now of that rising 20-week moving average. Keep, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Amgen reported last night. Amgen, uh, I, I was surprised on this one. I thought with Amgen breaking out that we'd have a really good report. Revenues, $5.8 billion. The market was expecting $5.86 billion. Earnings, $2.89. Market looking for three oh four. So missed on the top line, missed on the bottom line, but technically continues to hold up above the, both the rising 20-week moving average and price support. So Amgen technically still looking good, although fundamentals were not what we were looking for. Merck reported this morning. Merck came out uh, with revenues that fell just slightly below expectations, 10.43 billion versus 10.45 billion. Earnings beat though, 98 cents versus 94. I'm watching this gap support level here. The stock you can see is down with the overall market, but it is getting close to a key gap support level on the daily chart. That will be worth watching. And I uh, wanted to pull up the Dow Jones U.S. Pharmaceuticals Index because I talked about this breakout and the fact that I thought it was bullish. Well, we have pulled all the way back down now. We're testing that 20-week moving average. I think that's going to be a real critical area. Last chart, biotechs. Also making big breakouts. Talked about how bullish I am the biotechs. It's been a rough week for the biotechs as well. Pulling back down into an area of price support between about 21 uh, 2120 and maybe 2170, something like that. And you can see right here, 2172, uh, testing these, this, uh, support area. All right. I'm going to take a break, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Erin. I know she's got a really interesting scanning segment for everybody. So take it away, Erin. All right. Let's get this party started. Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you about how to sift through your scan results. Uh, I'm not gonna really go over how to scan. I just wanna show you pretty much the, the way that you can uh, share the results. So uh, figure out how to go through those results. So I've, I've set up a, a list of uh, chart scan results and I'm gonna show you how to go through that. But here's the, the basic run through and I'm, I'm gonna go through this part pretty quick, but I'm gonna go through each of the steps uh, closely later but the first thing of course is you want to run your scan and then you need to save it to a chart list because you cannot manipulate it unless you have it in a chart list so those are the first two things obviously you're running the scan but uh, save the results in a chart list after that uh, i suggest you view all of them in candle glance and i have a little asterisk here because uh, i'm going to show you how to create uh, what I think is the best candle glance that includes PMO. So I'll show you that uh, first. But uh, then I, what I would recommend is delete freely 
have no problem hitting that little trash can button because if you have 50 something stocks in that chart list that you need to go through, be really picky on the first glance. Uh, you, why not? You wanna just find those perfect setups. And honestly, if you have results of 50 something and you end up deleting most of them, well, you, maybe you wanna rethink putting the money in and maybe you might wanna uh, just put some things on a watch list. Uh, look for the first thing I think you should do once you have it in candle glance is you want to look for that best, uh, the best PMO configurations. And I'll talk about that shortly. Find easily defined support and resistance levels. So once you've found the ones and, and deleted the ones with PMOs that aren't interesting or don't look good, uh, next, look for those support and resistance levels. And that could be the, you know, the typical horizontal support and resistance and where price is in relation to those horizontal resistance levels. But you could also look at your rising bottoms and declining tops lines as well and look for breakouts and that sort of thing. The next thing I would say, look for prominent chart patterns. Chart patterns are great, but they're not um, always that uh, successful. So I wouldn't go buy a chart pattern first off. That's kind of your next level of sifting. Uh, weeding out more. So if you still have quite a few after you've gone through these uh, first steps, then this is what I would do next to start looking for those chart patterns. And I'm not going to lie, my eyes will sometimes go right to the chart patterns first. Um, but I, I am disciplined enough to be looking to make sure that PMO is where I want it to be and that price is where I really want it to be, not just uh, get into it based on a chart pattern. So yes, you wanna reduce those re results as far as possible. Be as picky as you can possibly be. There are lots of chart setups out there, quite a few. Maybe some days there aren't uh, a whole lot. And like I said, maybe you just you know, sit and wait. Uh, but this is a great way to get your watch lists going and then you can start just scanning on those lists and you don't have to get stuck with so many results. Then after you've really narrowed it down, then it's time to look at them uh, individually or on a 10 per page setup. So you can really see the details and that might change your mind as well because you may see a, a PMO that's rising, but then when you get it on the chart and you look in the thumbnail, you can see, yes, it's rising, but it's starting to decelerate. It's not moving up quite as quickly, meaning there might be a turnaround, uh, those sorts of things. So you wanna look at uh, everything very closely on an individual level. But the first, oh, and then you add them to your watch lists, et cetera. But the first thing I'm gonna go over is uh, how to get a candle glance set up. And it's, it's truly uh, very, very easy. So let's go over here and I will show you that. Okay, let's go over here. All right. So the best way to get your candle glance going, and I'm just gonna put, uh, we'll just put Apple in here, what the heck. So obviously um, I don't want this much information on my candle glance chart. And actually I should go and show everybody what candle glance looks like in case you haven't seen it. But if you are an avid watcher of the show, so ca candle glance is like this. So you can get through quite a few charts uh, just scanning them, but you get to decide, you can decide how you want these charts to look. You can determine your time frame. You can determine what indicators. Uh, you really have a lot of freedom there, and I'm going to show you how you might do that. So I'm going to pick Netflix right here. All right, so this is my default, and obviously this is the one I want my candle glance to look like. So I'm going to go through, I will check all of the parameters I want. You know, I can take volume out. I can make it now six months. Uh, and I'm going to go over here. So this is that one. This is the chart uh, example that I have for my candle glance. So I set it up all the way, the way I like. You can put colors, you can do whatever it is you'd like. Um, but I like the five months OHL C bars, that's my thing. Uh, I wanted the 20 and 50 on the candle glance chart. And of course, I really wanted to have that PMO because that's really what I do most of my uh, sifting using. That's, that's my primary indicator. So I want that one to be prominent. So once I've got that, everything all set the way I want. I can either add new, but right now I have one already. 
But what you would do is add a new one and just instead of new chart style here, uh, save it as candle glance. And when you save it as candle glance, from there on out, every time you look at things in candle glance, they're going to look like that chart that you just set up. So I think it's very important to get your candle glance uh, set up well. Uh, not that the default is horrible or anything, um, but I think it's it's better to have obviously the indicators on your chart that you that you use the most, whether it be the PMO or the PPO or uh, MACD, whatever it is. Uh, those that is uh, the best way I think to set it up. But there you can see you get your 20 day EMA. There's my 50, and of course my PMO. All right, so that's how you set up a candle glance. So let's go back here. Give me a moment. All righty. Okay, so let's go through uh, the list here. So the first thing that we're going to do is, um, okay, wait, I didn't want to do that. Hang on. We're going to first run and scan and save to the chart list. So I've already kind of done the work for, for us on this one. I went in already. I ran my scan and I got 51 entries. Uh, what I ended up doing, because honestly, my regular scan uh, did not did not come up with these this many results. I had to really um, pull it back as far as what my um, scanning parameters were to allow more stocks to come in. So honestly, your first thing that you could do to prevent getting all of these results is to, of course, look at your scanning code and adjust it so that maybe it's a little, it narrows things down a little bit more, like add the scooter in there or add, you know, uh, another crossover of some other indicator or, you know, add, add more in there and that's going to give you less results. But in, in today's exercise, I wanted more results. So I started taking out some of those, um, those functions that narrow it down. So anyway, I have all 51, but I can't do anything with them really. I mean, I can do it by scooter and I can look at these, but I can't manipulate them look at them in candle glance or anything until they're in a chart list. So you need to store them. I prefer, um, I use something, I call it scan dump. And actually I learned that from uh, Greg Schnell is I have a couple of uh, baskets here uh, that I just put my scan results in. I, it's just that uh, area of in between, you know, I've got the results I need to, to go through them and then from there I'll save them to something else. So the next time I run a scan, I don't really care if I overwrite this whole chart list because this is pretty much my manipulation zone here. So we've got all of them in here and I want to look at it at candle glance so I can get a bigger picture view here and start getting rid of some of these because it's just too many, obviously. So uh, candle glance, I got it all set up. Now you can uh, delete your candle glance charts by hovering over that right corner and you'll get a little trash can. So it makes it easy to just get rid of stuff you don't like. So remember, we're looking for PMO setups uh, that are that look healthy. Uh, so for example, this one, the PMO is below zero. It's trending lower. Um, I can just see right now with price, that's not a good uh, a candidate. So I just push the, the trash can, it's gone. And now I can move through. This doesn't have enough data. I'm gonna get rid of that. I don't want to invest in something like that. So I'm going to go through and look at all these. This is an overbought PMO. I mean, the, the price chart here looks OK, but I want to look at something where there's plenty of PMOs here that are in oversold territory. So I'm looking for oversold. I'm looking for, um, in fact, actually, I think that's what this one was going to show us. So we've done that. So the, we're going to look at how to find the best PMO configuration. So here are those good configurations. I got ahead of myself. I apologize. You want to look for oversold, meaning at the bottom of their normal range. Uh, or look for them where they're just above the zero line, because you know if they're oscillating above the zero line, they're more than likely a strong candidate just uh, to begin with. Uh, look for plenty of overhead travel territory, meaning uh, that that's why you go for that oversold and that's why you go for just above the zero line. But make sure there's plenty of room for it to rise higher because, um, you know, obviously that's what you want the stock to do and momentum to continue to do. So you want to have plenty of room so that it doesn't get entirely overbought. 
unlike the MACD, the PMO is bounded. So it does have a normal range and it can be compared to other stocks. It's very similar to the PPO. I wrote an article about it actually in yesterday's Decision Point blog, if you're interested in learning the differences between the MACD, PMO and, and uh, PPO. So we wanna get, uh, we prefer bullish confirmations or positive divergences. So you wanna look for uh, PMO bottoms maybe that are rising uh, or tops that are rising and going along with price. So that's one of the other things I would look for. Okay, so let's go back here. All right, so we're going through that PMO process. All right, so I'm just looking here, nice oversold PMO. Um, I'm looking at that price pattern though and that 20 day EMA negative crossover. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna trash this one. Uh, lower PMO, but not too negative. Uh, you do see that this stock has been trending down. Uh, so I don't see anything overly exciting here. So I'm gonna erase that. So, I mean, it's very quick, but we're gonna do this. I'm going through them all with you because that's what we're doing here as far as this workshop. Uh, so I'm just going to go and, and I may not uh, delete some that maybe should be deleted on the top or bottom, but I'm just going to go through the easy ones, uh, the ones that have overbought PMOs or the PMO configuration just doesn't look good to me. So I'm looking at these, all of these look okay, that's oversold, that's above the zero line, but there's plenty of territory to move, that's oversold, I like it. This is on the overbought side, but it is just above zero. And you can see that the range is pretty, pretty large because if it goes down to negative four, then more than likely it's going to get up to four. So I'm going to leave that in because <clears throat> it's just above the zero line. All right, PMO trending lower. Um, it's below zero. The PMO here looks like it's decelerating. It eh, doesn't look too good to me. I'm liking this setup, oversold, moving up. This is a little overbought, but like I said, we're going to keep it in. Here's another one, PMO. That looks good. Uh, let's see, any that don't look good to me just on PMO on its own. So all these look pretty good. I'm not seeing anything too bad. Uh, flat PMOs, I'm not a fan of, so I'm going to get rid of those. Again, like I said, be uh, you don't have to be super selective because you're looking for that best scenario, the best case scenario. So flat PMO going to get rid of that one. You can see um, not enough data. I like to see more data. Uh, let's see, PMOs in the oversold territory. Pretty flat PMO, trending lower, flat price. Uh, that can go away. All right, so you can see we're already uh, getting this down to a manageable amount. In fact, let's go ahead and look at it at summaries just to see what we're looking at. All right, this is still too many, in my opinion, for uh, in order to go through. So we're going to go back and go back to that candle glance and start getting rid of a few more. So we went through and got rid of some of the PMO uh, setups that we didn't like. Now let's get a little bit more picky. Let's look at some of the price action. Let's look at the 20 and 50 day EMAs. Where are they going? So I'm looking at this. The first thing I see is that declining tops trend line and a possible breakout. So I'm going to keep that one. This one, price action's been mostly sideways. Um, you know, I'm not really thrilled with uh, the way it's congregating and can't get above the 20-day EMA, so I'm going to get rid of that one. This one, I think the PM looks pretty good. I'd probably want to look at this more closely to see what's going on with that declining tops trend line. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that one because I'm kind of interested to see what that one looks like. This one's got an interesting breakout, but overhead resistance is really close. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to find something I like better. Uh, you can see here we've got a cluster consolidation below the 50 day EMA. Not interested. All right. This one is mostly consolidating sideways, but you can see a breakout from a very steep declining tops trend line. Overhead resistance is still up there. Uh, I want to look at that one more closely. 20 below the 50. Uh, the PMO looks pretty good, and we don't get a lot of uh, signals on it typically. Um, but the price pattern's just not uh, interesting enough to me because it's all uh, been under the 50-day EMA, and it's turned down when it reached that 50. All right, continue and continue. 20-day EMA is starting to turn up on this one. This might be a good uh, bottom fish 
uh, to look like bottom feeding. We'll take a peek at that one later. This one, possible double bottom. Overhead resistance is still pretty far away. Uh, it is a lower price stock, so generally I don't um, move into those. They're just too volatile for my, my taste, so I'm going to actually take that one out. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why when I narrow my scan down, that chart would not have come up on my radar. So I wouldn't have even had to go through it and figure things out. Uh, but again, for the, for the um, exercise we're doing today, I wanted more results. All right. You can see it's not overly time consuming. You can certainly be more picky. I'm trying to go through this quickly for you. Uh, because it does, it starts to become second nature. Uh, I don't know how many of you play blackjack at the table, but the more you play it, the more you get to see those setups and you get familiar with when the dealer has this, then I do this. When I see that, then I do this. So it's just a matter of constant and consistent practice. And you'll see uh, as you invest and make these choices, whether they were good or not, and then you can, can go back and figure out where, where you went wrong maybe with your analysis. This one I can see is curving down. We're getting that breakout, uh, but it still has to test that 20 day EMA. Uh, I, I'm not interested at this point. This one's interesting because I see that rising PMO. That's nice, but it's flattening out. Uh, price is consolidating while there is some room to, to get it to move up to test the top of that uh, channel, I guess you could call it. I think there's some possibility, but again, I'm gonna be picky today. Uh, let's see, that PMO you can see is decelerating beneath its signal line just from the candle glance, I can see that. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, that one looks still pretty good and there's a nice breakout. That's worth a, a better look. There's another one with a nice breakout. It's above, uh, it did manage to puncture up above that 50 day EMA. I think this one looks interesting. Uh, the, the PMO bottoms are rising with price bottoms. Gonna keep it. A possible double bottom there too. We'll have to look at that more closely. Declining tops, trend line, breakout, uh, probably a runaway, uh, breakaway gap, and then now a runaway gap above the 50 day EMA. Look at that beautiful PMO. This one looks very interesting to me. So I definitely wouldn't take that out. And, uh, eh, you know, trending lower, uh, PMO flat. Actually, I'm going to just go ahead and get rid of that one. PMO starting to decelerate on this one. I can already see. Uh, if you don't have the eyesight <laughs> or you don't have your reading glasses, when you go into the 10 per page uh, or, or looking at the actual chart, obviously, you'll, you'll have a little bit better uh, opportunity. All right. I'm seeing a giant double top here. I don't know what's been happening before. But uh, I don't like that. <laughs> and it broke down below the neckline. Granted, it hasn't made its uh, terrible decline, but I can just say right now that's not uh, a good uh, selection. This one's had the breakout, would like to see the pullback, but let's go ahead and we'll look at that chart a little more closely. Let's see how, how many more do we have? How are we doing? We're getting there. There's still so many. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I don't know how much uh, more you guys wanna see and we're getting low on time. Uh, but let's go back here and I'm, I'm going to peek at a few that I thought were very interesting. Hopefully I can remember which ones they were. All right. This one I remember because of the gaps. So I'm going to pull this one up. Looked very interesting to me. So I'm going to go ahead and start annotating this just for the exercise for you all. So you can see a very steep declining tops trend line here. Let's see if we get that actually lined up here. And get that a little skinnier. So really nice breakout. It gapped up when it broke out. Look at the nice volume pattern here. Uh, another one, we're just now getting above that 50-day uh, EMA. <clears throat> so I think this one would be really interesting for my watch list, but I need to see where, <clears throat> excuse me, where support and resistance is, uh, horizontal support and resistance. I would kind of go around here uh, because I, these tops, yeah, I could dri drive it down here as well, and then we can see beautiful breakout, right? So I'll probably leave that just so I can see that there. And let's look at some of these other support and resistance levels. And these are great areas for your targets. You know, if you wanna um, look at a more short-term trade, I think that's a good way to find your targets, but really nice PMO, um, you know, coming right in at that oversold territory. Uh, look at the volume. Like I said, the volume pattern looks good. And now we're seeing OBV movement. Uh, so this one I think was really uh, quite interesting, as we say. And I'll just save that for us. And let's see, one of the other ones that looked interesting. I think it was 
This one I'm seeing a little bit of a flag possibility. Okay. I know this is really fast, right? So this is my last one. And hopefully this has given you at least a, an idea of kind of what I do and just some uh, strategies on how to, you know, uh, sift or weed out uh, the bad part, the bad, not the greatest setups. Let me not say bad because uh, if it came up in your scan, there's something about it that was good, but you want to get the best selection. Look at this 20 just turned up above the 50, 520 day EMA positive crossover, PMO turning up above the zero line. So there's still some strength here. Nice little breakout. And where's my support and uh, resistance lines? Look at that. Nice target. Um, right now, if I look at these bottoms, you know, it's gotten through here. It's broken out. I would probably, if I were looking at this to, you know, to set a stop, I'm going to look at these other tops back here and maybe drag it a little lower. Uh, right in there. That might be a, a opportunity for a stop on uh, something like this. But look at that upside potential. Really nice. So anyway, that that is... Uh, the sifting scans workshop and i do hope that it was helpful to you i know i went very very fast um but you know you can rewatch and, and maybe it'll help you so uh the, the idea though is pick your indicators stick to them and be very 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 selective so yeah i know i'm looking at some of the comments oh you you'd get into that this is this is what happens when i do the scans is i find these and I would say that the next level would be starting to look at maybe the industry group. If you need more reasons to uh, you know, fix that, like for example, uh, there was an uh, ultra short in there, I think pro ultra short. So typically I don't uh, invest in those. And you know, at this point it's, it's looking pretty good because we've had a pullback, but it ultimately really is that where I wanna be. So there's obviously more to it. Um, when you get ready to invest, but this gives you that opportunity to just narrow things down. So, uh, and, and as I said, I had to expand this scan to include a lot of things that I wouldn't even be looking at mainly because I wanted to give you an opportunity to see how you can go through it quickly and just get rid of and move and move and keep going. So I hope that helped. Um, so it, yeah, somebody's saying, well, why did you pick that? I, the reason I picked it is when I saw it on that candle glance, you know, I like the PMO, I like the setup, I like the chart patterns. And so that got it in front of me and get, gave some attention to it. Um, I'm not suggesting any of these as investments. Uh, it's really just an exercise. So with that, I know it doesn't leave you a lot of time, uh, Tom, for under the radar, but it does leave me time to get a drink of water and <laughs> get ready for 10 and 10. There you go. Um, yeah, did you have a summary slide on that? Uh, you know what, I, I do, but I, I think I have to go back to it. So yes, let's go back here. Uh, let's look at, I'm gonna put these in there, but remember sifting scans, run your scan, save a chart list, view them in candle glance, delete freely, be picky, be very, very picky. I can't uh, um, stress that enough. Look for the PMO configurations that are best. Find those easily defined support and resistance levels, even if it's uh, rising bottoms, declining tops. Look for prominent chart patterns, something that catches your eye about a chart. And then you reduce your results as far as possible. And then you start going like I did, uh, viewing individually or in a 10 per page setup to give you an even uh, quicker and another way to go through and start deleting, deleting, deleting. And once you have that, of course, then go ahead and add it to your watch list. You can start scanning on it, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there you go. All right. Well, let's move on to under the radar. I've got a, just a few charts that I want to show you. So first, let's um, I'll take you over to a blog article I did yesterday, because there's really two areas I want to focus on for this segment. One is the retail space. Yesterday in the sector industry watch um, section of the uh, daily trading places blog that I write each morning, I did feature the XRT. And this is a group 
retail that tends to do very well from February to April. And of course, we're just moving into February. So I looked at this chart and it had a negative divergence on the daily chart, starting to break down below the 20 day moving average. So I had highlighted a key area of support between about 4550 and 4650 that I would be watching on the XRT. And then on the daily chart, you can see actually it's uh, the 20 week moving average is moving up pretty rapidly at 44 and a half. Um, so that 4450 all the way up to about 4650, there's some pretty key support areas on both the daily and weekly chart that we have to keep an eye on. Now, the reason I brought that up is if we go into, let me pull this uh, XRT up on the daily chart and let's uh, look at the live version. And you can see that since that post, uh, we have been dropping even further on the XRT. And we're currently now down at 46.28, moving into this first key area of support that I had highlighted. So retail is an area that, to me, is under the radar right now. It's a group that was on fire, no doubt. But because of the poor action that we've seen, I mean, the group is down about almost 10% just in the past uh, seven or eight trading days. But I think that's a good thing because we did have the negative divergence. We were way overbought on both a daily and a weekly basis. And so I think it's, it's setting up some potential opportunities in retail. So let me walk you through a couple of stocks in retail that I think look interesting. First is uh, Zoomies. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But very heavy volume back in early January on this gap up. We printed that black candle and we have slowly been working all the way back down to where we have now hit pro both price support and this gap support area with an RSI sitting back down at 39 as opposed to being very overbought. So I think this is a stock that looks kind of interesting. And then I had, I think, um, yeah, let's take a look at Buckle, BKE. Uh, Buckle, another one that has been sideways consolidating mostly after setting a high to start 2018. So this is one, and you can see with its high, higher prices, lower PPO, negative divergence, sideways consolidation. Now we have BKE with its PPO at the center line, sitting in a uh, range, but closer to the bottom of the range, and with an RSI at 44. So again, instead of being overbought, we're back down in a very palatable area of the RSI. So I like these stocks as they pull back and get closer to support because I can manage my reward to risk much better. I think BKE looks interesting. And I mentioned this one, I think the other day on the show, GPS maybe is a momentum sleeper, I believe. And it's continued to drift a little bit lower since we talked about it. But I think we've got really good support on GPS coming in just below $32. And today's low is a 3203. So that one's getting close. The other area I wanted to mention was if we take a look, actually, let's pull up a weekly chart. And I'm going to pull up the biotechs. Um, anyone who's followed the show knows I'm a big fan of the biotechs. They've had a rough week. You can see down about 4.5% this week, but made a huge breakout uh, above the 2015 high. I think we're starting a major uptrend in the biotechs. We're actually really continuing a major uptrend, but the breakout confirms it to me. So I actually like biotechs on this pullback. And you might say, well, higher prices, lower PPO. We got a negative divergence. But that was a huge breakout. And look at the volume coming in. It's kind of hard to argue slowing momentum um, when you've got a big breakout on major volume. So I think this pullback is presenting some opportunities. So a couple of stocks that look interesting to me. Biogen, B-I-I-B. Beautiful move up recently on heavy volume. Notice the volume has been drifting. Today's volume pretty light and we're sitting right on the 20-day moving average. RSI at 53, coming back down from overbought territory. So I think uh, Biogen looks kind of interesting. Uh, just a couple of others. ILMN, this one's been selling off quite a bit on the daily chart here since its earnings. But if you pull up the weekly chart, it's getting really close to a key 20-week EMA test. So I like the fact that it's pulling back, getting close to this gap support area, and the rising 20-week moving average. So this is one to to kind of keep an eye on. MYGN, this is Myriad Genetics, also recently made a breakout. Pulling backs had a rough week down 10% this week, um, but the volume's just kind of been moderate to the downside. And again, it's in a pretty good space. And then the last one, I'm gonna pull this one up on a daily chart, because I think this one looks very interesting for those of you like these small stocks. Huge gap up on very heavy volume about six, seven days ago. And look at where we are now, coming back down, testing gap support and the rising 20-day moving average. 
This is an area where the stock could make a pretty good move back to the upside. It was at 540 six trading days ago. Now it's at 445. That's a pretty sizable haircut uh, on CERS, and it's back down near a palatable area again where you can manage your reward to risk. So those were some of them that were under the radar. Um, take a minute here just to kind of recap those. So we've got the uh, uh, retail stocks, we've got the biotechs, and there you can see many of the different uh, symbols that I just went through. Now, before we get into the 10 and 10, I believe we may have Grayson Rose with us. Grayson, are you with us? I am. Hey, there he is. Like magic. <laughs> like magic. How's that? That's what, uh, that's what happens when you have a video producer behind the scenes working the, uh, working the strings, right? Oh, like I thought magic. I did that. <laughs> yeah, you do that. If you do that, we'd be crashing and burning right now. I thought I just snapped my fingers and you were there. <laughs> Something like that. Well, so we got some exciting stuff to talk about today. We are talking about ChartCon. So we did the official open registration yesterday. Hopefully a lot of you saw the notification that's been posted around the site. It's a blue banner that's at the top of a, a bunch of different pages. But the exciting thing is that ChartCon registration is officially open. I wish I had like a bell to ring or something like that. We need that. Maybe the... Uh, Video producer here can get some sound effects going at some point, but <laughs> exciting stuff. We got ChartCon registration officially open. So I wanted to come on and chat with everyone about that a little bit today, make sure that everyone is totally aware of what's going on with ChartCon. Uh, many of you probably attended ChartCon 2016. ChartCon 2016 was an exciting change for us in the past. We've been doing ChartCon since 2011, uh, but in the past, it's always been a physical conference hosted in Seattle. We had to get everyone to fly out. You had to stay in a hotel, all of that stuff. We made a big change in 2016. We went virtual. We went online. So ChartCon 2016 was actually our first experience using Livestream, which is the platform that you're currently using to watch this show, to watch Market Watchers Live. So Livestream allowed us to stream the conference. We were actually all down in California. We flew everyone in. And we had this fantastic two-day conference, everyone watching live. We had about five times more viewers than we had ever had at any chart con in the past. Tons of positive responses. And it was a totally virtual event. So for us, we were all in the same room, but everyone else was watching live. You can watch from the comfort of your own home, whether you're at your, uh, you know, at your office, in your bedroom. You could be sitting in bed with your, your PJs and your cup of coffee watching chart con. It's a pretty fantastic thing. So what that means for you guys is that there's no need to travel. It's, it's a low cost event. You know, some of these conferences that we, uh, that we go to, they're $1,500 for a ticket. It's crazy. And then you add in travel costs and everything like that. Uh, it's pretty expensive to go to a physical conference. So for our viewers, ChartCon is affordable, it's convenient. And the greatest aspect of it too, is that you can watch it in the future as many times as you want. So because it's an online conference, you have full access to all of the, uh, the presentations, the two day event for as long as you want. If you were a ChartCon 2016 attendee, you can go back today after the show and rewatch all of ChartCon 2016 right there. It's still there for you. It, it never goes away because it's in a virtual format. It never goes away. Um, and on top of that, because live stream is a great platform during the event, let's say Martin Pring is up there on the stage. He said something really insightful. You want to go back and take a look at what Martin said. You can scrub back using this, this sort of built-in DVR feature and you can, can re-watch whatever he just said and then jump right back to the live conference. You can watch things over, um, over again right there. So the virtual conference format has been a huge success for us. Uh, people really, really loved it at ChartCon 2016, and we're doing it again at ChartCon 2018. So we've got registration open right now. It's a pretty low price, $199 for two days, and it's really not two days. It's really... 2 million days because it goes off into the future forever. It's, uh, it's, you know, you never lose access to it. You can go back and watch uh, all the presentations of, again, as many times as you want. Um, so registration is open. We would encourage everyone to go register right now, save your seat. Um, but it's kind of a virtual seat. So your seat is wherever you want it to be. Tom, it's on your couch. I'm going to, I'm going to watch from your couch or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you painted a really bad picture with the whole bed thing and the laptop and in your PJs. Yeah, no one wants that image. No one wants that image. But um, no, it's it's we had that was our you know our biggest response to ChartCon 2016 was wow this was incredible. Uh, it was Saturday morning. I was sitting there with my my oatmeal and my cup of coffee, and I was watching all of these fantastic presentations uh, for for two days there. So 
it's a it's a pretty special thing. So registration's open. I want to show everyone how to get to uh, the the registration page and the info info page and everything. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Here's what we got. I'm on the dashboard right now. Um, and so as you can see, we've got this this banner up here at the top of the page. It says registrations open chartcon 2018 returns this August. So if you click that button, you're going to be taken right to our chartcon page and it'll have a big green registration button. You can uh, you can register right there. Um, really easy 199 flat. That's the price you get complete access to the conference both days. And like I said, you can watch it as many times as you want in the future because it's all recorded. Um, if you do close this notification, this is a, a notification that we send out and there's a little X, you can close it. If you do close it, you want to get back to there, click the blogs tab, scroll down a little bit on the page, and you'll see there's a, a chart con section right there on the side of the blogs page. So if you, if you do close that notification, you want to get back to the page, you can get to it there. We're going to pull that up though. This is our chart con page. So again, go here, click the register button and you're in business. You can register right there, super, super easy. Um, and we're gonna be sending out you know, more information as we get closer to the event. The event is, this is the most important detail, August 10th and 11th. 199 is the price, August 10th and 11th. Um, and it's in Seattle, Washington, but that doesn't matter for you because you can be in New Zealand watching the conference. We actually had a guy at 20, TarkCon 2016, might even be listening to the show right now. He was on a boat. He was floating around, I think it was the Mediterranean. And he was watching ChartCon from a boat. That was pretty cool. Um, so anyways, we've got a fantastic agenda for you here. You can come to this page and you can read more about it. But we've got uh, a bit of a, a preliminary agenda up here on the page, two days. Uh, and actually, we're going to make some, some exciting changes to this featured presenters list. The big news is uh, last night, actually, I was talking to both of them. We got two more speakers coming and they're, they're fantastic speakers. Really excited about it. Tom McClellan, who was recently on Market Watchers Live uh, nice. and was also on CNBC on Tuesday, he's going to be joining us as a, as a feature presenter at ChartCon 2018. And on top of that, uh, a gentleman named Dave Keller is going to be joining us. Dave is, uh, he's been writing actually in the Top Advisors Corner blog for a while, but he is the former president of the MTA and the former uh, director of technical research for Fidelity. Uh, so, Dave has some, always has some great stuff to say. Um, really, really excited to have Dave there as well. And Tom, as always, has fantastic tough stuff to say. Um, you too, Tom Boley. Too many oh, Toms. I, at the thought were, I thought you were talking about me. You are talking about Tom McClellan. <laughs> too many Toms here. But uh, So that's the big news. We're actually going to, I have to go in here and, and update the agenda with, uh, with Tom and Dave on, on the schedule. But that's going to be, be a really great addition. So we're looking forward to having them. Um, but the list just goes on. I mean, we got tons and tons of big names talking at this conference. It's going to be fantastic. The, uh, the stuff that, uh, that we got lined up is going to be really, really great. So before I get out of everyone's hair, one final announcement. We've got, like I said, the online registration is open now. If you want to come join us at the conference, uh, 199, August 10th and 11th, you want to join us online, you can watch live from, from the comfort of your own home or your office, wherever you are. That registration is open right now. We've got something new this year. We've got our VIP packages. Now, some of you are probably familiar with this. I believe Tom and Aaron have been talking about it a little bit. But if you go down to the bottom of this ChartCon page, we've got this, this little block here that explains a little bit about our VIP pages. So if you click this button, it says learn more. We've got a separate page for ChartCon VIP packages. So like I said, we're going to be in Seattle. If you'd like to join us in person, you want to rub elbows with all of this, these, uh, these fantastic presenters that we got lined up, you can come and join us at ChartCon in Seattle, August 10th and 11th. We are opening up a, a very limited, it's a very small number, very limited number of seats in the room if you do want to come and join us at ChartCon in the room. So I'm going to scroll down here to our VIP packages, let everyone take a look at that. We've got two VIP packages that I want to cover really quick. Uh, the first is our sort of basic ChartCon VIP package, although it's not very basic. It's super, super exciting. Um, it covers, does not cover airfare, but it covers transportation to and from the hotel, uh, to and from the airport. Um, three nights at the Grand Hyatt in Seattle, which is where we're, we're going to be hosting the conference. Um, a welcome reception Thursday evening. And then, of course, VIP seating for ChartCon. You get to be you know 15 feet away from the stage. Uh, you get to hang out with all of the presenters. We're going to be doing special dinners 
special events, breakfast, lunch, other meals, they're, they're all included. Um, really, really a, a unique opportunity. I can't stress that enough. I mean, it is because it's such a small group, we're all together, we're all hanging out. It is the most kind of intimate, unique conference, investing conference experience that, that you're going to find anywhere. Um, it's, it's something really, really special. Can't stress that enough. If you want to even turn it up a notch from there, we've got a second package called the ChartCon VIP plus cruise package. So we love our presenters. We're flying them all out to Seattle. We are going to hop on a cruise ship and actually take off set sail for Alaska for a full week. So we're going to be, be taking this cruise up to Alaska. We're going to be hanging out with the bears and uh, seeing the glaciers and everything. If you'd like to join us on that cruise, we are selling, again, a very limited number of seats on the cruise. So you get to come to ChartCon. It's the same package, same VIP package, three nights at the Grand, Grand Hyatt in Seattle. You get to, to be 15 feet away from the stage and everything. And then you get to come on the cruise. You get to join us there for a week. It's, a, it's an incredible cruise up to Alaska. Actually, I had uh, Tom McClellan emailing me last night saying it was has always been on his bucket list, and he's, he's really excited about it. Um, so if you'd like to join us on the cruise, that is a second option. The key there is that registration closes pretty soon. It closes on February 10th. we gotta got to line up all those cruise packages uh, well in advance. So if you'd like to join us on the cruise at ChartCon or after ChartCon, you are totally welcome to do that. Go here, reserve your seat. It's, again, a very, very limited number. We only have a couple left. Um, it's a, a pretty unique opportunity to come on this cruise with us for a week. We're going to have everyone there. Uh, something just totally out of the ordinary. So if you'd like to join us as a VIP, definitely explore that. There's uh, limited time to register. Come here. And if you have any questions, email our support team. We've got a, a thing down here. You can contact our support team. They'll answer any of the questions that you have. Uh, they're super, super helpful. So um, definitely ask them any of the, the questions that you do have. But we want everyone to go register for ChartCon. If you if you can't join us as a VIP, that's totally fine. The normal conference experience is fantastic. You're going to get a ton out of this online registration. Um, you get to watch online for, for both days and into the future. It's it's a pretty pretty incredible format for a conference. Um, you know, the, the traditional issue is you go to a conference, you, you, unless you take the world's greatest notes, you forget everything, you know, the second you leave. But with ChartCon, you've got it all there. It's recorded. You can watch it again in the future. So it's it's a pretty powerful conference experience, I'd say. So August 10th and 11th, hope you all go register. You know where to find it. Uh, again, if you if you go to Stock Charts, you click the Blogs tab. You can you can find that or look for that blue notification banner up at the top of the page. So, and under the, under the entertainment, uh, you know, you didn't talk about it, but. Uh, you're going to be in a bull costume and you're going to be fighting the bears on a glacier. Is that what I heard? That's true. That's true. Tom and I are going to joust. We're going to be dressed up as uh, as bulls and bears, and we're going to hopefully go find some natural bears of our own. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. But it will be. I mean, I actually did this cruise as a kid. I was probably eight years old, and I remember seeing the glaciers and everything. And we took a seaplane out to this beautiful lake. I mean, it was an incredible trip. It's a, it, it truly is a should be a bucket list item for everyone. That cruise up to Alaska is just, it's unbelievable. So it's a its a pretty unique experience uh, in and of itself, but then to add in the dimension of, you know, being with all of these expert technical analysts, getting to rub elbows with them, get dinner and, and drinks with them on the boat, go on these excursions, it's, it's amazing. It's truly a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So if you're interested at all in the VIP package and you can make it, we would love to have you. I know Tom and Aaron would love to meet you all. So definitely look into those VIP packages. But if you can't, the normal ChartCon experience, like I said, is fantastic. It's going to be going to be something really special. And with the the guest list, the uh, speaker list that we have lined up this year, I think it's going to be our, our best conference yet by far. So really looking forward to it. Very cool. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Talk to you guys soon. Yes, absolutely. There he goes. Thank you, Grayson. I tell you what, we got uh, about 25 minutes left in the show and we got a oh lot to pack in. So I have already annotated the uh, first chart for the 10 and 10 and we'll just do a few, I guess, or, uh, you know, try and see how fast. Sure. We can do these. Let me give everybody a quick peek at what's going on in the market and then we'll get right into that. So it is one of those days. Lots going on here. So. All right. The, it looks like the market is still not doing what it needs to do at this point. Uh, if I can get my screen to come share.
as they say, patience. <laughs> All right, there we go. Finally. All right, here we are. So as you can see, the Dow is still on its way down. Uh, we're seeing the S&P 500 uh, also continuing lower. But as you can see, uh, we're not on the intraday lows right now. We're a little bit above them. Uh, so we could see a little bit of a recovery. But let's face it, today is going to uh, just be a difficult day altogether. NASDAQ fell uh, on the open, sort of formed a double bottom here, but uh, wasn't able to complete that. So we're seeing it pull back again, but mostly moving sideways after that very difficult move in the morning. We're seeing Russell 2000, also that double bottom, uh, but it's heading back down. We might be looking at a reverse flag, which would uh, be a problem there. Uh, Wilshire 5000 we're seeing also jump lower on the open, but it's now consolidating sideways. Treasury yields are up currently reading at 28.34. And we can see UUP gapped up, uh, hit its intraday high, and is now sort of bowing and topping over. Uh, we'll have to see if that uh, gap support will hold. And commodities also gapped down, but are making a little bit of a, a move back up. Uh, we can see oil having a very difficult day right now. And, uh, but it has picked, a, uh, picked back up almost half of the losses uh, of this morning. Gold is also down, gapped down, and in similar fashion to oil, has rounded and is coming back up to test uh, gap overhead resistance. VIX is higher, reading at 1523 right now. And we can see declines uh, certainly leading advances at this time. With that, I'm going to complete it because we do have a lot to go through. And Tom, I'm going to turn it back over. And you did have your first Procter & Gamble PG. 10 and 10 to 1. So we'll just race on through. All right. First one is already annotated. Uh, obviously, we had a big low here back in early November. So I've got two support lines drawn across, one a closing support line, one an intraday. And you can see with the, all of this selling on heavy volume that we've seen recently in the Procter & Gamble, we are in that support area. So that's the level you want to watch. Okay, next one. I'm sorry. I was, woo. All right. Next one is Starbucks. Uh, obviously, S B U X. All right. Yes, yeah, Starbucks is back down to a, a, a short term support level that I would really watch. Um, we did gap down recently below the 20 day moving average. And you can see right here, we made a breakout back in November, went down and tested it, and then kept moving higher. I don't like losing the support level, to be honest but we are now down at another key support level. Volume on this move to the downside, as you can see below, has been very heavy. I think the key area on a rebound, you're gonna have this declining 20-day moving average and gap resistance all are both up around $58. To the downside, you've got this short-term support at about 55.75. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, the next one will be W-D-A-Y, W-Day. Workday, W-D-A-Y. Uh, I think this, this chart looks pretty good here. The pullback uh, isn't bad, especially considering the way many stocks have been treated recently. I think the key here for me is that we've got a PPO that continues rising. And notice so far throughout this, uh, so far in January and early February, we've been able to hold the rising 20-day moving average. So that's where I would just put that green arrow in there as a reminder. That's what you want to hold with the PPO pointing higher. Okay. Next one is R car, R C A R. Okay, R car, Renova Care. Uh, beautiful move up, excellent volume. I think this chart looks great. The problem is it's just way overbought. So for me, I'd be watching some, waiting for some kind of a pullback. Uh, you've got gap support there, the top of gap support here, the rising 20-day moving average between, and we have had this huge move up. It just It's not that it can't go higher. Obviously, there's a lot of interest, and you can see the heavy volume that's coming in, but the problem is where do you set a stop if you get in at this, at this level? It's almost impossible to manage risk. Uh, about the only thing you could do really is just put your stop in below the prior day's low and just keep riding it as long as it keeps going higher, but that's not typically my style. I don't like buying these stocks that are really overbought. I'd rather wait, have some patience. At some point, the sellers will begin to kick in and uh, get a pullback in, a, in an entry at a much more palatable area. Okay. Next one we have is Overstock OSTK. Great. Overstock. Um, again, I think we're at a pretty key support level. We have lost the, both of our key moving averages. 
but we are near the low that we saw in December here. So we, we broke out. I would have liked to have held the uh, prior high, which then became price support. And on a closing basis, we did. But we have now penetrated, gone all the way back down close to the, the open. And there was some pretty heavy volume on this reversal. So I think that we're at a key level here on overstock. A failure to hold here, the problem is the next key support level isn't down until you get the low 40s. And we're sitting at $59. So I just don't, uh, I don't want to take any chances if it doesn't hold the current support area. Okay. Next one is SCG Scana Corp. All right. Uh, well, things have kind of fallen apart. We do have a shot here to double bottom after a nice gap up early in January. So the key support level would be that recent low that we rebounded from. Look at the volume come in on this gap up and move higher. But since then, we have completely trailed back off again. I would expect this low to hold. And the low is down uh, close to the 38 area. If we can hold on there, uh, the reward to risk on this trade is pretty good because you're, the top of your trading range now is up at that 48 level. So short term, I you know a, a little bit bullish, but I don't like the fact that we gapped up. We had a breakaway gap and we went straight down. We've lost all our moving averages again. This price support level really needs to hold. Okay, next one is MGM, MGM Resorts. Yeah, the gambling index has pulled back quite a bit, but I think it's looking pretty interesting. I would feel better about MGM if we get a reversal this afternoon and we hold on to that 20-day moving average on the close. A couple of key areas to watch. You've got the bottom of gap support here, the top of gap support there. We've just tested or we're in the process of testing the top of gap support. So if we could finish back up above that 20 day, we'd have a reversing candle off of a downtrend after testing both gap support and the 20 day moving average. I'd be more bullish if we get a reversal later today. Okay. The next one is AZN AstraZeneca. Okay. I like the space. I like the stock. Um, there's a key area of support that I think needs to hold as long as it does, I would be okay with this stock. You can see the prior high back in mid-October. We broke out above it. Look at the volume coming in to confirm that breakout. Since then, we have been holding the support area. So $35 is a key support level. And to the upside, the uh, 38.75 level or thereabouts is your resistance. I think it's gonna break out before it breaks down, but uh, the, the, the stop for me would be a close below 35. Okay. Number nine is Twitter, TWTR. All right. Uh, yeah, I like the action here. I love uh, the fact that it came down and held gap support. So first thing you can see is that earlier low. Check out, this is where we had closed right before the heavy volume gap up. We ended up going all the way back down. I would I would have thought maybe the top of gap support would have held there, but it didn't. We actually made a little bit of a push back down into the uh, gap, the bottom of gap support, maybe a little bit of spring action under the Wyckoff theory. But the the uh, move to the upside, check out the volume. This is a really big move. I think Twitter looks as good as it's looked in quite some time. Nice uptrend. All right. The very last one is going to be BU. Well, let me try and get it. BUFF. Yeah, this was a really hot stock and it's leveled off for a while, which Considering what the market's been doing, that's probably not that bad. Uh, so I think that uh, we're watching a negative divergence just kind of dissipate with sideways action, mostly sideways action. So I think as long as we hold the 50-day moving average to the downside, I'm okay with this one. I would probably give it down to that level because that is where your 50-day is. You can see multiple uh, pullbacks have tested that area as well. So right about 32 and a quarter would be the downside for me. Just above 34 is the upside. But here is your movement to the upside with that lower PPO reading consistently. So I think this sideways consolidation is helping because we're eliminating the, uh, the PPO, the overbought PPO, and we're bringing it down much closer to that centerline support. I, I think uh, BUFF looks pretty good here, although the closer it gets down to the bottom of this uh, trading range, the, the better the reward to risk. All right. And that completes the 10 and 10. And as you can see, 
I believe we're seeing all of the stocks we covered. I will have these in the uh, Market Watchers live chart list. Very easy to get to. Just go to the blogs tab, find the Market Watchers live blog, and that's where you'll find the link to get to our chart list. And next up, I'm going to go ahead and look at some sentiment. And I, 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 I would say that it's real interesting right now, but I think it's overall we're reading kind of neutral on this. So um, that's kind of where I would uh, go with it as far as the overall sentiment as I share my screen here. I do not know why this keeps doing this, guys. I apologize. Let's try again. All right. And just as a reminder, I mean, we have had some issues over the past week, week and a half, but we do continue to work on them, both audio and, and some of the, the uh, video issues as well. But um, we promise we will continue to work on yes. until we get them figured out for you. Ah, I finally listened to my 10th click. All right. So uh, I'm going to look at uh, some of these uh, major indicators that I always look at for sentiment. I just remind everybody that when you look at sentiment, sentiment is contrarian. So if everybody is bearish, that is bullish for the market. And if everybody is very bullish, then that is bearish for the market. So here we go. Here's the S&P 100. These are the uh, put call ratios uh, for the CBOE, equity, and OEX that we get online. And what we track, what I track, is when the number gets very, very low, that means that we're looking at bullish readings. Okay, so I have got this down here so that oversold becomes um, the bottom here. So what I'm looking at at this point is we're still looking at a lot of bullishness here, but there, we're starting to see a rise now. And that means that we're starting to see a little bit more um, bearishness sort of poke in here. Uh, but I think the damage was done already. If you look here in the thumbnail, I mean, we had these bottoms come in uh, already, and this is a top on the uh, OEX, which makes sense. Typically it's used more as a hedge. Uh, it's used differently. So, at this point, I almost feel like that drop has come in already, uh, but we still have some some move uh, up to go. We, we don't see really uh, a huge amount of bearishness out there when we're still looking at, at um, a, a ratio, a put call ratio at 0.83. So we're still very bullish out there, but we have bottomed right now. And typically when you're coming out of these bottoms, uh, you will see some decline. And I have some examples back here. Uh, the ones in green didn't work out that way. We ended up with consolidation. And in this case, the market just continued higher. So uh, I think we could be getting close to that point where we need to turn back up. Uh, this was a, has been a very good pullback. And is, uh, it's made it painful for a few people, but it's something that was necessary. And I think that uh, that, so with that chart, I would say that right now we're still looking at bullishness as far as the put call ratios, and that is bearish for the market. The next one is the AAII investor sentiment numbers. This is a poll from the American Association of Individual Investors. And so it's a, it's a poll. Uh, it asks people like you and me, you can go to the AAII website, and I believe you can participate in this poll. And you just say, I'm, I'm bullish or I am bearish. And they tally up all the numbers. I like to watch the ratio here in the bottom pane. And we look for these extremes. In the case where they're extreme, that means you have excessive bullishness going on. So I'm going to direct you right now over here to the thumbnail. Sorry about that. And you can see how this ratio has been coming back and back and back. Uh, one, of course, is when you have an even amount of bulls and bears. So we still are seeing uh, quite a few more bulls than we are bears here. That's still what I would consider bearish for the market. So if you're starting to, even though we're losing a little bit of those, uh, well, actually, here's the thing. If you look in the thumbnail, we haven't lost really any of our bulls. The, the bulls are pretty much the same as they were last time. Uh, but we are seeing that increase in bears. And so 
that could actually be considered somewhat bullish for the market. So we are getting some, um, that's why I'm saying it's neutral because I feel like I'm getting mixed messages from these indicators right now for sentiment. This is the name exposure index. This is a National Association of Active Investment Managers, I believe is what it's called. These are the big guys, the big money movers, the mutual fund uh, owner type uh, watchers. So here we go. And you can see that we're, we're watching, and I'm gonna pull it back here to the thumbnail a bit. And you can see that we're watching this uh, exposure uh, moving down uh, on average here. Uh, we did get a little bit of a bump here, but look at how far down we've gone. So now we're at a reading of 50, just above 55. And when I made the comparison across the board here, you can see this is a very low exposure um, reading. Certainly, what is it, the second to the lowest of all of the last uh, you know year and a half. So when I see that exposure being pulled back that much in a bull market that's this strong, um, you know, they're feeling bearish. These big money managers are feeling bearish. And like with any sentiment, when they're bearish, it's bullish for the market. Now, I caveat that with uh, the fact that a lot of times these guys do give us a pretty good idea of what we might want to consider when we go forward. If they're pulling back, eh, we might want to move a little bit more into cash. But I would say that when they start pulling back to a great degree, that is bullish for the market. So we're going to look now at the right X assets <clears throat> ratio. This, uh, I love this indicator, these indicators, because we take the basket of right X funds. There's bull funds, bear funds, and money market uh, assets. And they report those every evening and we follow those. So that way we can see where the money is actually going. It, you know, it's one thing to just tell a poll I'm bullish or bearish, uh, but it's another when you go look at where the actual money is flowing. So right now what we're seeing is as far as the bear funds, we're actually starting to see a little bit of a move up on those. And, and it's been pretty much decreasing this whole time. So that tells me there's just a little bit of bearishness out there. Interestingly, people are we're not seeing an increase in cash. I, I'm really surprised by that. Um, it's the assets have continued to move lower. We're getting them a little bit higher, but on average, we continue to lo uh, lose assets from the money market uh, at RightX. And then we can see that the bull and sector funds are continuing to move somewhat higher. What concerns me right now is we're seeing this ratio, uh, and I say all-time lows because uh, I invert my scale. I know everybody gets mad about that, but uh, this is an overbought uh, reading. So when I see things overbought, when I see these at all time lows, that means people are very, very bullish. And that's overbought for the market because when things get really bullish, it's bearish. So that's why I invert this particular scale. But you're seeing a reading that we haven't seen uh, in the last year. So we have a real um, preponderance of bulls to bears as far as the asset allocation is considered. And I think that that is something we could be concerned about at this point. It's a very bullish. I mean, people are very bullish. There's all this money that's continuing to go in and not uh, go out. So this worries me somewhat. And you know, I would say when you look at this, the fact that we're uh, seeing a, still seeing an increase and really at the top of the mark as far as assets for the year, uh, that that is uh, showing a lot of bulls out there. And when it when uh, they're bullish, if the money's bullish, then that's bearish for the market. So with that, let me uh, show you the summary slide so you can uh, see what, what we uh, came together with here. So the first one is my put call ratio, and it is currently showing um, bullish readings. We're starting to see that move up. Um, there you go. The bullish readings are receding, and that's bearish for the market because uh, we're still seeing those bullish readings. AAI. I, bulls are about the same, but we're getting a little bit more bearish uh, as far as the bears increasing. And so I would say that's somewhat bullish for the market at this point. Exposure is near 2017 lows for the uh, name. And I think that's bullish for the market overall. And the right X ratio is very overbought. Money is entering bull funds and even some bear funds. And I would read that as uh, bearish. So the right X ratio suggests bullish exuberance, and that's bearish. 
but we're getting mixed messages as far as the others. So overall, I would say, unfortunately, sent sentiment is mostly reading neutral right now. But I do have a little bit of concern about uh, the big money managers pulling back their exposure that much. Uh, you know, they could end up pulling it back even more. And the fact that they're that nervous does leave me a little bit concerned. Um, but we're, when they get that, when that exposure gets that low, it, it really is bullish for the market. We generally will see a move out of that. This might have been just all the pullback uh, that we need and people are going to start getting back in. But that's something to consider. So with that, I am all done with that sentiment update. Uh, any comments uh, on everything today, Tom? What are you thinking? Well, it is an interesting day for sure. Actually, it's been an interesting week. Um, not so good if you've been on the long side like me, but mm -hmm. um, anybody who's been shorting uh, finally got their wish this week. It's been a rough week for the longs, no doubt. Um, you know, I got, I did get a question recently asking about uh, the historical pattern, seasonal patterns, and what to do when you've got, um, well, I guess the, the general question was that they found themselves mostly uh, following the seasonal patterns. It sounded like as a primary indicator, um, you know, that when we head into a period where the market historically has done very well, like we're in right now, by the way, I mean, usually the first part of the month tends to be very strong. And that certainly has not been the case here in February. But uh, the question that came in was, what do you do, you know, when things kind of go against history? And I would just say this, number one, uh, historical patterns or, or seasonal patterns to me are always secondary to what's going on in the market. Um, even the beginning of the month, which is no doubt. I mean, I go back to 1950 on the S&P 500 and I have some strong data to prove my point. It's no doubt the end of a calendar month, the beginning of a calendar month are the best times to be in the stock market historically. But the days, you know, the, the individual days only go up about 60% of the time. I mean, we're not talking about a guarantee as you head toward the end of the month or in the beginning of the month. And so I would just stress that if, if the technicals start telling you to get out uh, just because you're sitting on the 31st of the month or the first of the month, that would not uh, sway me from my my technical views. So, uh, just like the the PPO or the the uh, RSI or stochastic, whatever, uh, to me, all of that along with seasonal indications are um, secondary indicators. Price price is uh, price and volume are the two indicators that to me combined are the most significant in the market. So I just wanted to make that point. But we've got you know another minute to go, and then we're ending a week. Um, what do you think about next week, given what's taken place so far this week? You know, um, the money managers are nervous and that sort of thing, but so are investors. The VIX is rising again. Honestly, I think when I when I turn in my uh, results for next week, I'm going to go in as a bull. You know, I, I just think that we got the pullback. I think this is probably going to be enough. Uh, we're probably going to see Amazon kick it next week and possibly bring up the nasdaq numbers as well so i i'm feeling bullish going into next week even with a lot of people are concerned and like i said i'm a sentiment follower and people are getting real concerned that means good things for the market typically yeah i'm kind of on the fence um you know the thing is we've been talking about the market needing a pullback for a long time but then when it starts to pull back you know, it really weighs on your emotions. I mean, it gets pretty tough when you're when you're trading, especially in the short term. I mean, I've gotten stopped out of some positions here over the past few days, and I've probably built up a little bit more cash than what I normally have uh, during an uptrend. But I see more room to the downside. I mean, I'm I'm hoping that we get a rally this afternoon. I'd feel much better about being long over the weekend if we rally this afternoon. Mm -hmm. but so far, it doesn't look like we're getting that. So I'm. I don't want to be bearish, but I'm just going to say neutral. I think things could just continue to consolidate going into next week. So I'm just going to go with neutral, I think. I think that's uh, fair enough. That was, you know, I was thinking about that, but I, I'm going to go with my sentiment. And uh, I think we're probably, the pullback's just about over, if not over. I will see. I'll, I'll see. But uh, next week, uh, here's our schedule right now. We've got everything stock charts. Chip Anderson, president of stock charts, will be here to talk to us. Gordon Scott, you might know his, him from the CMT. 
uh, as well as Investopedia. And our very own Arthur Hill will be joining us on Thursday, February 8th. Awesome. Awesome lineup. No doubt about it. Uh, can't wait to uh, have all of our guests on. We, uh, we always have fun shows when we get our guests in here. So that's uh, always something to look forward to. Uh, we certainly appreciate everybody tuning in. I know it's been a rough week, but hey, there's another week ahead and we'll see what happens next week. Uh, again, thanks for stopping by today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. We'd love to get your feedback, uh, hear what you think of Market Watchers Live, and certainly uh, like to hear any suggestions you have for future shows. As a reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Friday afternoon, everybody. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday. Happy trading. Thank you.